Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for coming. This is the um, this is the network security stream. So, if this wasn't the room you thought you were in, now's the last time to um, to escape. So, yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Should we look? No. Yeah. Okay. So you know, fire exits are here and here. Your nearest exit may be behind you. Count the rows. Yeah, we all know how that goes. So we've got three presentations this afternoon. Um, first one from. Roland Dobbins from Arbor Networks, entitled When the Sky is Falling, Network Scale Mitigation of High Volume Reflection Amplification Attacks. The next session is going to be from CF2, for all, also from Arbor Networks, but looking at some of the key findings from Arbor's 10th um, Worldwide Infrastructure Survey. So some of the things we learned in Roland's talk, we're going to be seeing some of the statistics around that in the second session. And the, the last session is... is um, Hiromi-san from Intec, looking at um, a little bit of an int introduction to what JP Cert um, is doing around securing IPv6 gears. So, without further ado, I'll hand over to Roland, and um, there we go. My name is Roland Dobbins, and I'm a senior ACERT analyst with Arbor's um, Security Engineering Response Team. I'm a router monkey by trade and an availability monkey by necessity. Um, what we're going to be talking today, about today are high volume reflection amplification attacks that are absolutely devastating, that have a lot of, um, a, a lot of uh, collateral damage on the internet. And so we're going to walk you through a few different varieties of those talk about some details. Then I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, C.F. Chui, who's going to be talking about Arbor's 10th Worldwide Infrastructure Security Report and talk about some internet-wide um, statistics that have to do with reflection amplification attacks and other forms of DDoS attacks as well. So we'll go ahead and get started. Just to make sure we're all on the same page, DDoS attacks are attacks against availability. So when we're talking about DDoS defense, what we mean is maintaining availability even in the face of attack. So what do we mean when we say a reflection and amplification attack? Amplification means that an attacker can send a relatively small amount of data and end up being able to pummel his target with a relatively large amount of data. So that's the amplification part. By reflection, what we mean is that the attacker is able to reflect his attack through an abusable server, service, or application so that when the target gets pummeled, the target is not seeing the packets coming directly from the attacker, from the systems that he's using to initiate the attack. And in reflection and amplification attacks, the, uh, the attacker actually, what he's doing is, he is spoofing the IP address of his target and he's pretending to ask a question or make a request on behalf of the target and then reflect it through some other system which will then turn around and dutifully answer the target and pummel the target with the attack traffic. So the impact of these attacks can be absolutely overwhelming. They are volumetric attacks. Now with most packet flooding attacks, the biggest impact that you get is from packets per second or throughput. This is not the case with reflection and amplification attacks. These are high bandwidth attacks. And the impact that they have is that they end up absolutely filling up peering links, transit links, core links, et cetera. And so they, first of all, crowd out legitimate traffic coming to your customers or originating from your customers. They also end up filling up the core links and the peering links, and choking out bystander traffic as well, traffic that happens to be traversing your network um, on its way somewhere else. So the collateral damage footprint of a reflection and amplification attack can be quite high. And of course, the end goal of the attacker is to render the target unavailable, often by bandwidth saturation. And there's also a, a negative collateral effect on the reflectors and amplifiers. 
that the attacker is abusing. There's a negative impact on them because it, the attacker is stressing them. So those user, user populations who depend on those services are affected as well. So what happens when we see a 400 gigabit per second reflection and amplification attack targeting a particular user on an ISP network? So we have our user down here, in this case maybe a user who's on fixed wireless or mobile wireless, and then we get 400 gigabits per second worth of, let's say, NTP, reflection and amplification targeting this particular user. Well, certainly, this user actually goes down, right? But because of the extremely high volume of this attack, the peering links are saturated, the core links are saturated, the down links are saturated, et cetera. So we have a network-wide impact on this network, plus, again, bystander traffic that happens to be traversing this network on its way somewhere else. So there are two main factors that make these attacks possible. First of all, the fact that we don't have universal anti-spoofing or source address validation deployed at all of the edges, the various edges of the internet. The second component is misconfigured abusable services running on servers, routers, switches, home CPE devices like Soho routers, et cetera. But the biggie, of course, is the ability to spoof. If the attackers could not spoof the IP address of the target, these attacks would not be possible. And you can see, if you take a look at the trend line here, from 2002 to 2014, you see attack volumes going up. CF will talk about this in more detail. But almost all of this uptick that you've seen is, is, is the result of the growing popularity of these high volume reflection amplification attacks. They've been weaponized and, they moved, and they, they've actually moved down market. So what types of devices are being abused? Home broadband routers that are misconfigured from the factories. Some of them are actually insecurable. You, you simply cannot secure them so that they cannot be abused by an attacker. Commercial grade PE routers, big routers, from major manufacturers like Vendor C and Vendor J and other vendors as well. Servers, actual servers, whether they are physical servers or real servers that are running services that are misconfigured and can be abused. The Internet of Things is really becoming the botnet of things. And so there's all kinds of embedded devices that are running unsecured services that can be abused for reflection and amplification attacks. We've seen DVRs, video surveillance systems, all kinds of devices, even printers leverage um, by the attackers for these types of attacks. So it's a really pre prevalent problem. So a little bit of terminology here, the attack source. This is the system or, system that's under, or systems that are under the control of the attacker that he uses to, be, to initiate this attack. And the key is that the attacker has to have administrative control over those systems so that he can spoof the IP address of the actual target of the attack. Then there's the amplifier. This is the service that, or application that's running on some remote node that will take a small, relatively small input and then give a relatively large answer. Then there's the reflector. The reflector is the system that the attacker bounces his traffic through and in almost all cases, not all cases, but most cases, the reflector and the amplifier are the same system. And then we have the, the, the terminology of the attack leg. So initiator to reflector amplifier is one attack leg. Reflector amplifier to target is another attack leg. Now, spoof traffic is what makes these, these attacks possible, but it's actually very important to understand that the only spoof traffic that's involved is the relatively small traffic volume that is on the leg of the attacker to the reflector amplifier. When the reflector amplifier answers back the, uh, to the unsuspecting target, those, I, uh, that traffic that is sent to the target is not spoofed. So if NTP is being abused, a bunch of abusable NTP servers, when the target is looking at all of this traffic that's being sourced from UDP 123 that's pummeling him and choking his links, the IP addresses for the NTP 123 packets that he's seeing are real. And so that actually has a positive effect 
in terms of mitigation because you can say, okay, it's a reflection amplification attack and the systems that are pummeling me are being abused by some other attacker, but those source IPs are not spoofed. So I can black hole them or ACL them or what have you. So there's many different services that are available uh, that can be used for reflection and amplification attacks, and the attackers are discovering more all the time. This is not a new problem. We first saw this problem emerge about 20 years ago, back in 1995, but it's really become into vogue because the tools have been automated, and so it's easy for less skilled attackers to actually leverage this. These are five different um, vectors that are, that are the, probably the most popular right now. We're gonna focus on three of those today. So um, it's very important to understand that the general principles that we're gonna talk about with the vectors we discussed today apply to all reflection and amplification attacks. So once you understand how an NTP attack works or a DNS attack works, the general principles apply um, to all of them. There are some protocol or service specific differences and it's important to understand again that the attackers are constantly looking for new services to leverage. So NTP reflection and amplification attacks. The attackers really like to use this because they get a 1,000 to 1 amplification ratio. So uh, the attacker spoofs the IP address of the target and what he's doing is he's actually abusing misconfigured NTP servers out there that have exposed what we call level six and level seven administrative commands. There's one command in particular the attackers like to issue that's called monlist. Monlist gives a list of all the different IP nodes that have contacted that particular NTP server for time sync services. And so the attacker can send a small packet, like a 50 byte packet, plus layer two overhead, and then he can get multiple monlist replies back. And remember, he is spoofing the IP address of the attacker, that's how the attack works. The attacker also will select his source port. Most of these attacks we see um, the attacker sources UDP 80 as his source port because that's the, the port that he wants to pummel on the target size. Once he sends this single 50 byte monlist request uh, to the, uh, a series, you know, multiple NTP uh, abusable servers, he'll get multiple streams of 468 byte packets that are answering the query that the target didn't actually uh, answer. So let's see what this looks like uh, in terms of bandwidth. The bandwidth is huge. The largest ones that we've observed so far is over 400 gigabits per second. 100 gigabit per second uh, NTP reflection amplification uh, attacks are, are at very common. In most attacks, we see between 4,000 and 7,000 NTP servers abused, but we've seen up to 50,000 um, abused in one single attack. So how does this work? Here we have the attacker. Here we have the target, 172.19.234.6. And here we have a bunch of abusable NTP servers. So the attacker sends his mon list query to these abusable NTP servers on the internet. He sources the source port as port 80. The destination has to be UDP 123 because that's what NTP uses. He sends his 50 byte packet and he sends his mon list query to all of these servers. And he's pretending to be this target over here. Well, of course, these NTP servers turn around and they dutifully answer the question that this target never actually asked. And so we end up with peering links, transit links being filled. Certainly the last meter, last kilometer, you know, the port that this target is, is plugged into um, is saturated as well. Huge collateral damage, as well as the abuse of actually sending continuous monolith queries um, to the abusable servers. So in a nutshell, that's reflection and amplification for you. Now, the, the beauty of this, however, is that we can understand what's happening if we use NetFlow, flow telemetry, NetFlow, JFlow, CFlow D, NetStream, IPFix. So here is what an NTP reflection amplification attack looks like using NetFlow. This is a relatively small attack, 15 and a half, half gigabits per second, 4.2 million packets per second of UDP. It is NTP amplified attack traffic. And we can actually take a look 
and see the sources. And, you, and in this particular attack, around 1,100 sources, 1,100 misconfigured <coughs> NTP servers were used by the attacker. And remember, these are real IP addresses from the target's perspective. So NetFlow tells us which routers and which interfaces on which routers where this traffic is ingressing our network. So that's traceback for us, very useful. And then we can also look at more details of the traffic. And so we see, again, it's 15 and a half gigabits per second. And we see we're looking at this particular router and this particular interface. We scroll down a little bit here. And here we have about 468 bytes per packet. So it's very easy to classify this as an NTP reflection and amplification attack. And of course, we see here um, the source port, again, is NTP, one is NTP, which is UDP 123. And the destination port is primarily 80. It's UDP 80. Why do the attackers do this? They like to pick 80 because most uh, end users don't really understand the difference between HTTP and UDP. And so they see port 80, and they think their web server, for example, is being attacked directly on TCP 80 when it's really UDP 80. And of course, we see uh, via the magic of NetFlow, which interfaces on the router the traffic is coming in and where it's egressing our network as well. NTP reflection and amplification attack. So the next service that the attackers like to use is DNS. And DNS uh, is attractive. You, the attackers can get up to about 160 to 1 uh, amplification ratio. The thing about DNS as well is that DNS is absolutely necessary. It's part of the control plane of the internet. And so folks tend to be a little bit hesitant to filter DNS queries, right? So it's very important that you leverage technology like NetFlow uh, technology to be able to understand when the DNS response flood, responses that you're seeing are actually part of a re DNS reflection and amplification attack and, and not legitimate queries. So again, the attacker spoofs the IP address um, of his victim. He, he picks a typically a large record that he's already identified, like maybe a DNS TXT record that has a big PGP key in it, or he just uh, does a DNS any query, where he's saying to an authoritative server, give me any, anything that you can give me on this particular uh, resource record. And so the servers reply, and there's, there's two variations on this attack. The first variation is the attacker sends the query directly to the authoritative server, which then answers the target and pummels the target, or the attacker leverages um, an intermediate layer of, a, of open DNS recursive servers or DNS forwarders. And there's roughly 27 million of those out there on the internet today. So the response sizes that the attackers uh, typically get are anywhere from 4K, sometimes up to 8K. So the, be the beauty of eDNS zero is that it allows us to have large UDP responses um, in, in the DNS, but in this case it actually um, hurts us because we can get um, very large uh, packets for these reflection and amplification attacks. Um, the packet sizes received by the target are generally going to be, you know, 1500 bytes or less of the actual packets due to prevalent internet MTUs. So you see both initial and non-initial fragments with most DNS reflection and amplification attacks. Um, uh, we see t between 20 to 30,000 recursive DNS servers, uh, open DNS uh, recursive servers abused uh, regularly with these attacks, up to 50,000. Um, we've seen thousands of, of, of uh, and, or, and hundreds of thousands of authoritative servers leverage directly um, in these attacks. Um, a lot of well-known authoritative uh, DNS servers are anycasted. And so the attacker will simply send his uh, spoofed query and it will you know, hit multiple instances of the same anycasted authoritative server. So this is the direct method. Again, the attacker pretends to be 172.19.234.6. He sends a DNS query, a DNS query, it's about 70 bytes, and he's going to send it and he's going to say, I want to any resource record for example.com. And he sends this to the authoritative servers for answer, answer uh, excuse me, example.com. They turn around and they dutifully answer the victim who didn't actually uh, ask the question. The response is about 4K in size, and so it's going to be fragmented. There's going to be two streams of traffic. There's going to be the initial fragments that have the port numbers and the non-initial fragments that don't. And of course, the answer is 
you know, however, however many uh, resource records, for example, .com can fit into that 4K response. Here's the second variant. In this case, the attacker, again, he spoofs the IP address of his target, and he, instead of sending his um, DNS queries directly to the authoritative servers, he instead leverages these abusable recursive DNS services. And these can be actual recursive DNS servers, they can be home CPE devices, home routers, that are misconfigured as abusable um, DNS forwarders, etc. So he sends his query, um, and, and he can, again, he can pick his source port here, um, and he sends a 70-byte query, um, he's spoofing the IP address um, of, of the target, um, and he, he's sending multiple queries this time, and he is actually looking for a TXT record for pgp.example.com. So he wants a TXT record that he knows is going to be big because it has a PGP key. Well, these recursive servers dutifully turn around and query the authoritative servers, for example.com. They get the answer, and then the recursive servers turn around and answer the target, uh, in this case, it was about an 8K response, and what is the response? Well, it's the TXT resource record for pgp.example.com. So this one uses a layer um, of indirection. Here's what it looks like in NetFlow. I've artificially split out the initial fragments and the non-initial fragments uh, deliberately. Normally, you would see those together in a single alert, but I've split them out to show them to you. So this is a, a small attack. This is only... This part of the attack is only about 330 megabits per second. It's on a university network. And this DNS uh, reflected in amplified attack traffic. So you see the sources here. Um, and we could again drill down and, and look at the sources. I can already tell you, um, looking at these sources and doing who is on them, which, uh, by clicking the question mark, these are home CPE routers that are being abused as recursive DNS, open recursive DNS servers. So this is the second style of attack that I showed you with the animation. And of course, we see the source port, 53, right? Because it's a DNS answer. And then there's the destination IP address we've obfuscated. Here's the destination port, and of course, it, and, and of course it's UDP. We see the ingress routers and interfaces here. And we can look in detail. And we, again, we see our aggregate traffic stats. Now, we see here that the bytes per packet is about 1.25K. Now, remember, we were looking at a larger response, typically around 4K for most DNS reflection amplification attacks. They are fragmented, so you get the initial fragment that has the port numbers, then the non-initial fragment which doesn't have port numbers. And in this case, the initial fragments are about 1.25K. Does anybody happen to know why they're 1.25K? Any ideas? Because that's where bind the most popular DNS server software um, in the world, typically if it knows that it's going to be generating um, a, t uh, a response that has to be fragmented, it typically um, sends the initial fragment at about 1.25K, that's why. So again, we can see our sources here, and then we see you know, pretty consistent in terms of the initial fragment size. Again, initial fragment size, we can see where the attack um, is coming into our network, what routers and what interfaces, and where it's leaving the network to pummel the actual target of the attack. Now, I, again, I told you I had artificially split this up. This is the second component of the attack. So the first component of the attack was the initial fragments, about 330 megabits per second. This is about 138 megabits per second of non-initial fragments. So these are the non-initial fragments. And you'll note here that we actually see a source port, sorry, it says source port zero. That's not really true. Non-initial fragments don't have source ports or destination ports. Most NetFlow or flow telemetry implementations on routers um, send them with a source port of zero as a placeholder. Um, this particular piece of software actually have convinced the developers to change it so it will say fragments rather than source port. So again, we see where it's ingressing the network. We see the actual size here, 757 bytes. So we add that to the 1.25K um, we saw before. This was actually about a 2K um, resource record that the attacker was querying. And again, our port range, those are actually not ports because we don't have ports in non-initial fragments. Finally, SSDP. Um, 
Uh, attackers get between 20 to 1 to 83 to 1. Um, SSDP is a matchmaking service uh, that allows things like games to dynamically open holes in firewalls and NATs and things like that. It's been misconfigured on a lot of home CPE devices primarily, also on Windows XP systems, which there are a lot of those that are out there naked on the internet. Works pretty much the same way. The attacker chooses his source port. Uh, SSDP runs on UDP 1900, so he spoofs the IP address of the attacker, and he then um, uh, picks the source port that he wants the SSDP services to pummel uh, the target with. So here's our attacker. He's going to spoof 172.19.234.6, and he's going to send um, an, uh, an SSDP mSearch uh, enumeration query to multiple SSDP services, and most of these out there, these are DSL modems and cable modems and things like that. He's sending about 119 bytes, and of course they all dutifully answer. He's getting about a 9,800 byte response, so again, this is gonna be both initial fragments and non-initial fragments, pummeling the target, and also choking all the networks uh, in between as well. So here we are looking at one live on the internet. This is about a 42, and a half gigabit per second um, SSDP reflection amplification attack. Um, IP address, we've obfuscated that at the target. Um, and we see the, again, through UDP, we can see our, our uh, sources and our non spoofed. And you see together we have both the initial fragments that have the port numbers as well as the non initial fragments put together. I just split those out for you artificially earlier. We get all the traceback stuff like we saw before. And we can see. Um, again, so our average bytes per packet here is 465, and then we see the various source subnets, and then we see the port ranges uh, for the source ports, and we see that the attacker chose 300 for some reason as his destination port. So that's SSDP. So how much traffic do you have to send to get 100 gigs of reflected, amplification, reflected and amplified DDoS attacks? For DNS, you can send about 625 megabits per second, you get 100 gigs. For NTP, you send 100 megs, you get 100 gigs. Care gen, anywhere from 100 megs to five and a half gigabits per second, gives you 100 gigs. <clears throat> SNMP, 114 megabits per second. If you optimize your attack, gets you 100 gigs. SSDP, uh, anywhere from 1.2 gigabits per second to five gigabits per second, gets you 100 gigs. And the latest and greatest that we've seen attackers using, Microsoft SQL Server Replication Service, also known as SQL Slammer, right? SQL Slammer on demand, essentially. Uh, the attackers can get between 173 to 1 to 473 to 1. Uh, 473 to 1 of the amplification, amplification factor, so he can send between 211 megabits per second and 578 megabits per second to yield 100 gigs. So don't block stuff on your network indiscriminately. For God's sake, don't block UDP responses that are larger than 512 bytes. Don't block TCP 53. Don't block all NTP, right? Don't block all ICMP. You will break the internet if you do this. Make sure that you leverage all the various types of anti-spoofing technology that are available on your network from layer two uh, up to layer three as well so that you're not part of the problem. If you are a, an access network, a broadband access network, wireless or wired, you should seriously consider scanning your user base periodically to make sure that they are not running home CPE devices that can be misconfigured and used as reflectors and amplifiers. Jared Motch of NTT America runs openntpproject.org and openresolverproject.org. You can go there and query. He's constantly scanning the internet. He will tell you if you have abusable reflectors and amplifiers on your network. Uh, the collateral damage of these impacts is huge. So even though a lot of operators say, well, I'm not going to bother with anti-spoofing because it doesn't benefit me, it actually does benefit you because if nothing else, you're paying for transit because these are typically endpoint networks that are, are paying for transit that allow the spoofing. Use flow telemetry to detect, classify, and trace back this stuff. Make sure that your servers and services or your customer services, servers and services have reasonable network access policies. There's no reason that UDP 80 should be able to make it to a web server, uh, for example. Make sure that your recursive DNS servers are not open, that only your customers can use them. Don't enable SNMP on internet-facing devices. Don't run your NTP servers 
with the level six and level seven commands exposed to the internet, turn off stuff like CareGen that hasn't been used in 20 odd years, and regularly audit your servers and services to make sure that you haven't had any regressions um, sneak in. Make sure you have re reaction tools, source-based remote trigger black hole, flow spec, intelligent DDoS mitigation systems. Make sure you have sufficient mitigation capacity, whether you're leveraging the ASICs in your router, whether you're leveraging some other kind of box to do your DDoS mitigation, make sure you have sufficient mitigation capacity to deal with these attacks. Also, make sure that you have sufficient backhaul bandwidth if you're diverting the attacks into uh, a mitigation center. Um, use the power of the RFP to specify that CPE and PE devices that you're buying from your vendors are secure by default. And don't trust the vendors. Actually test them before you decide to make a procurement. Make sure you know who to contact your peers, your upstream transits, your downstream customers for assistance when you see one of these attacks, because you're going to need help. And make sure that you participate. If you actually operate in ASN, participate in the global operational security community. There are some closed vetted communities where you can help other folks and get help if you need it as well. Um, mitigation capacity is not an issue, by the way, just so that you know. Um, the largest attacks of this size that we've seen so far are 425, 450 gig gigabits per second. If you can construct um, a, a DDoS mitigation clustered system, uh, the biggest one I, th that I know about right now uh, in terms of capacity, of four terabits per second. So actually the limiting factor here isn't the potential for mitigation capacity, it's the actual bandwidth, you know, the actual core link, peer links, downstream links that are the limiting factor here that make these attacks so effective. So our conclusion, abusable services are widely um, implemented and misconfigured across the internet. There's large pools of them. There's some gaps in anti-spoofing and network edges that make these attacks possible. The attackers can achieve high amplification ratios. The attacks are relatively easy to, um, um, to execute these days because of the tools that the attackers have built with nice GUIs and so forth. Um, extremely high impact. The sky is falling. I literally have had customers call me up say, my network is melting. The sky is falling. You've got to help me now. Um, so this, these attacks po put the entire internet at um, sufficient risk. Um, I'm going to skip over this stuff. Um, it's actually in uh, the presentation and you can, uh, you can download it to see. But the key to understanding is that we're not doomed. To give you an example, NTP reflection amplification attacks have been seen for years. They kicked off in popularity in late 2013 and early to mid 2014. They were the attack du jour. We still see them today. But when they really became known to the script kitty community, we would see these millions, tens of millions of abusable NTP servers out there. A lot of operators got their act together, they cleaned them up, and so that population of abusable NTP servers has been reduced down to something less than, a from several, several million, down to less than 128,000. Those will probably never be remediated because they're on networks that are unmanaged and the operators just don't care. But we can see positive impact here. There are things that you can do. And aut automation and tools, I work for a network vendor, I can tell you, you know, tools are a good thing, but what's really important is architecture, planning, and your people. You can buy all the expensive tools in the world, if you don't have the right people, you won't be able to withstand these attacks. If you'd like a copy of this presentation, you can uh, use your QR code um, scanner to snap a photo here, uh, or you can use a short URL and get the entire presentation. All right. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Seth Chewy with, um, yes, yeah, showing us um, some of the stats from Arbor's network, network survey. Thanks, Roland, for a very comprehensive description of the reflection and amplification attack we have seen, so we know um, what kind of attack they are, how to prevent them, and then what we should do. Now, 
we'd like to actually share with you, and then you probably have the question about, so how many attacks we have seen? How big were they? Where or what are they attacking? Now, I want to spend the next 30 minutes with you guys here, <coughs> sorry, and then look at what we call the Worldwide Infrastructure Security Report. You see, this is a 10 years. We have been doing this for the last 10 years. What we have done is that every year we send out a survey to different people, and we ask them a number of questions, and then, it must be the lunch that I have, sorry about that. <laughs> What they have seen, what kind of attack they have seen, what kind of problem challenge in their organization, in their operation, what they think are important. And then we gather all these statistics. And at the same time, we pull out some data from a system. I'm going to describe it a little bit later. And then we put together some data we see from the real world, correlate with the result that we have the questionnaire. And this is the WISR. I encourage everyone to get a chance then come to our website and download a copy. So for the last 10 years, what have we seen? We've seen there's a lot of changes, obviously. I would say internet get bigger, we get more bandwidth, we get more application, everything is now on the internet. So you actually see that the threat concern and technology, and even there's a kind of like boring, we will see different things in 10 years ago, probably, the largest attack we have seen is actually under 10 gigs. <coughs> but these days, 10 gigs is nothing. So we actually look at all these on the data. We, we try to, we don't try to predict, but we all believe that statistic data is useful because we can somehow try to see where is the trend or what something has suddenly happened unexpected. So we're going to take a look at this one. First of all, about um, this year, we sent out the survey, I think, something like October last year, and then we put together a report and we released it at the end of January, early February. So we get about 280 something respond, and then 60% of them are from service provider, tier one or tier two, um, hosting operator or even mobile operator. But this is encouraging, that is nearly about more than 30% of the respondents come from government, enterprise, education. We start to break it down a little bit. In the past, we put everything together. But this year, we actually break it down into service provider, enterprise. We want to actually see some different viewpoint from different organizations. So you see this number breakdown, who are they, 60%. And what are some of the key findings? I probably need to actually read the text myself as well. Obviously, the first phase that continued growth in the peak at tax size, I think we all know about this one. As Ronan has mentioned, we have observed, we also have some data from system that the largest attack is close to 400 gig of attack. And more respondents and actually telling us that attack frequency jump up. I think more than 30% of the respondent has told that they see more than 20 attack every month. And then, a good thing about this one is that we start to see more people being more serious about protecting the network or protecting the customer. I think from a service provider point of view, um, from data center is that we see more intelligent um, that, um, mitigation system are being employed. People start to actually do anti-spoofing of the system. But there are also other findings we want to share with you later. Network security. Um, as I mentioned before, we also look at enterprise government, education, um, you can say enterprise customer sector, and then what are they concerned? Obviously, um, these are the top party, APT threat. The thing that we worry about is that less than half of the respondents told us that they are ready or prepared for an incident. They're generally not prepared for that one. So something happened in the network where they get compromised or whatever, they really have no way to deal with that. So this is something that we want to take note of. Other things about IPv6, um, we did survey about IPv6, look at our data, is that um, it's still not, we grow, yeah, it goes strongly, but we're not significant, still compared with IPv4. And then data center, we see a lot, big increase in terms of attack that happened, the hosting uh, operator, the data center operator, and 
this is also the same thing that they start to invest more in protect their infrastructure. DNS, now, uh, this is not a DNS reflection attack. We're talking about protecting your own DNS infrastructure. Something that we're a little bit concerned with we'll see later is that there seems to be a trend that's the decrease in the focus for DNS security. So people, for some reason, um, are less concerned about that one. But we are concerned about that. Security practice, as I mentioned before, um, a lot of the, this is more for the enterprise side, is that a lot of people say that they're not ready. They are not able to hire enough people, good people to do that thing. So I think there's also a trend that uh, a lot more of them actually going to re outsource these to third party because of that reason. Lastly about mobile, we're going to take a little bit about mobile. Okay, I think everybody heard about all this malware of Android or even uh, iPhone later. And as Roland had mentioned about, yeah, all this embedded internet thing, we're going to look at mobile operators specifically this year. We have a set of questions for them, ask them about what are your concerns, what are you doing? And then I mentioned about data. Now, this is what we call Atlas. Atlas is a system that we get actual DDoS attack data from the system of ARPA that's been deployed in the search provider. Currently, we have about what? 330 plus of customer actually sharing data from us. So these are real data. This is what the network see and this is what they tell us. About, I think we get a kind of good distribution geographically, like 30% Euro, 25 North America, 70% Asia. Get a, a good idea about how this look like, the whole internet, what kind of attack we're seeing and things like that. You see this graph from Roland all early on, compare all the past largest attack for the last 10 years. And as Roland has a poor now, starting from the, I think it's the, the end of 2013, this is where we see a lot of the NTP reflection attack start, start to um, increase it, and you see that certain spike to us. So the next question is, how big are they, where are they? And I have some data from the Atlas system that I pulled out. This is more for the APAC. So we have, I think, ah, I actually replaced this one. I actually have the worldwide data here, but I think it would be more interesting for us since we're in Africa, we want to look at the APAC. So I take a look at the system and pull out all the Asia country and what is the average attack size we've seen in the last six months, I think the last six months of 2014 and what's the peak? So you see it's not too bad, 500 meg bit per second average attack size. The peak is about 100 something, depends where you're looking at. And what are they? That graph actually, this is a survey that we ask from customer, okay, that we, when you see attack, what kind of attack you see. Now, just in line with what we have talked about, for the last year, 2014, is really all this reflection attack we're talking about, whether it's NTP, DNS, SSTP, charge N. Exactly, this is what we're looking at. And this graph, I want you to take a look at the table here. <coughs> the breakdown now. This is the worldwide data. The next slide is going to show you the APAC data. So look at the trend, look at the DNS actually decreased a lot and get replaced by NTP. And you see Q1, Q2, like 14% of attack are NTP. However, if you look closer, Q3 and Q4, you see which one is picking up? The SSDP. It look like once we have seen enough of this NTP attack and then we start to take out some of these abusable resources in the internet, the attackers switch over and find another target. And as Roland, you had just pointed out the SQL one. That will be interesting. We all remember this SQL slammer. It was like what, 10 years ago? Worm, yeah. Now it come back again. So this one seems to cycle back. So this is the Worldwide numbers, how about APAC? Now, APAC is, I think the NTP actually is still a lot. In fact, the maximum attack size we see from the NTP is about 127. So the largest attack we see in APAC are still NTP reflection attack. 
However, and then DNS is not the maximum, 97. But the SSTP actually max out 49. But given the fact that it's the last three months of the year, we stand to see a pickup of the SSDP reflection attack. So in 2015, it will be interesting to see whether SSDP will actually replace the NTP or not. But this is the APAC numbers. Again, this is a, just another graph that will show probably the last five years of the peak APAC attack size we have seen. One thing to point out is that, okay, the largest one is like 400, 300, that doesn't happen very often. However, the numbers of attacks with about 100 gig actually increase. So people are getting more firepower. The attack, I should, I should say not people, I should say attacker, getting more firepower in the hands. Look at APAC. Look at the 2014 was the maximum attack and where were they? So, and the first one is that they're all NTP reflection, the largest one we have seen. Uh, India has the honor to actually see, what, two or three of, in, I think Q1 and then Q3 and even Q4. All the largest NTP reflection attacks happen in India. Now, it doesn't mean that all the other countries doesn't say attack, it just happened, they actually being suffered the most. Mm -hmm. Before we close out on the DDoS data, I just want to show you the numbers of events of attack size is larger than 10 gig throughout the year. You can see that in the last six months of the 2014, there has been a um, rise up and then come back down again. And if you're probably, if you are a service provider, you start to actually look at, okay, planning your mitigation capacity, that would be some data you want to look at, maybe per country, what's the average attack size, what's the maximum one, and then how many um, event, attack event actually beyond 10 gig or even 50 gig of attack size. So this gives you some idea about the size of the DDoS. The next thing we want to show you, pop most of them are from the survey result, is that, okay, when you ask the people, okay, what are the attack, what, what kind of attack you see attacking what? Okay, most of the time service provider told us that is the customer, the subscriber they have. So you see more attack, not, the second one is the infrastructure. So the attacker, well in the past they may actually target your infrastructure, your router, your DNS, but 60% or more than 60% of them are still the customer, the customer they have. And then in terms of verticals, I can't read the slide, it's too far away from me, but I think the first one is actually government, is it? And then we have gaming. Finance will drop down a little bit. So this is the customer, the vertical, they're being attacked. Gaming is always very attractive for somehow they attract people to attack them. So these are the breakdown in terms of vertical. The kind of attack we have. So now 60% of them, or more than 60% are volumetric whether it reflection, amplification attack, or just simply flooding on TCP, same, but they are in terms of volume. About 30% or less, okay, they are t layer seven application attack that target uh, maybe the HTTP server or DNS, which in fact, when we ask our customer, or sorry, other <coughs> respondent the survey, talking about layer seven application attack, what are most popular? Which is no surprise that mainly HTTP, and also DNS. So the, this is the, the bottom diagram that show you. Now when we look at, this is from the survey, and we look at actual data from the APEC, it's kind of what we have seen from the respondent from the report. The number one attack is port ID, so target the web server, and then we see a lot of fragment. Remember the NTP refraction attack. Particular for SSDP, for DNS, a lot of time you get a packet which is larger than 1500 byte. And then this being, we call it fragment. So most of the fragment attack are actually part of the amplification and reflection attack. So this is another thing to show the evidence. So the next thing is why they're attacking you. Now, um, and oh, I should say, why is here? 
the top three motivation, nihilism, uh, well, geogra oh, well, ideology, political disagreement, is st I'm sorry, still among the top three of them. But we also see increased like, extortion, market manipulation, this kind of motivation. Now, in terms of frequency, this is actually what I worry a little bit is that, well, for the ex respondent actually tell, told us that more than up to 38% of them actually see more than 21 at that point. And even if I look at a graph, okay, 13%, they say that's more than 500 attacks a month. Sounds to me it's like they're getting attacked all the time. I mean, no one will uh, disagree that DDoS is a top priority. So for the SP customer, they tell us that, sorry, for the respondent who belong to the search provider category, they tell us that the customer said that DDoS is a top priority. And then the posting provider, the cloud, has been the top vertical. This year, compared to last year, the, the, the report we done in 2013, we actually see a large increase in terms from, from the hosting operating side, the data center. People say that they see a lot more attack. Maybe because a lot of the application right now moved to the cloud, the data center, and they've been seeing an attack more often. What the search provider used for detection of threat mitigation, NetFlow, NetFlow Telemetry is definitely among the most effective. Now, the, the, there's two survey questions. First, we ask them what kind of technology you use. And then the second question, uh, we ask them what are the most effective. Network telemetry is actually the most effective. Now, the second thing is interesting is that a lot of people use, look at firewall log to analyze whether there's a tag or whatever. But obviously, this is not particularly effective. And this is also the same thing that we can tell from the survey, from the report. And the last thing, uh, and then the second thing we asked them about mitigation. What do you use? Particular is assess list, and then the threat, um, this um, intelligent um, mitigation system. This is user what they use, so you can get an idea of how they try to deal with DDoS attack. And then we also have a part of the survey that we ask specific question to data center operator. In general, they're very similar to what the surface provider, the tier one or the tier two service provider answer is or are. And then two thirds of them report DDoS attack are the most concerned. I want to point out one thing in that the 38% of the attack actually exit the bandwidth. So it's been overwhelmed by all this probably large scale reflection attack. So this is a concern because no matter how much or what kind of equipment you put in your data center, if your upstream bandwidth has been saturated, there's very little that you can do about it. And we also ask them one thing here about what do they use to protect your data center now Firewall, IPS are still the top three deployed security technologies. Okay, however, 49% of the respondents see firewall fail due to deep dots. Something you have to be careful what you want to choose to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. So let's see what do I have. DNS, we mentioned a little bit about in the key finding. Compared with the result in 2013, we keep on seeing a decrease in from, from the percent of people actually focused in protecting their DNS infrastructure. I think that is not a good sign. I think everyone agrees that DNS is a very critical infrastructure resources. You want to take down your network, take down your DNS is actually a very effective way. So there's something we, we're concerned about. Is this because people are get distracted to do other things, so they're not doing this part? We don't know, to be honest. But this is something that, sorry? Yeah. Hmm. Um,
Yes. If Papa could be, I think this year we did not actually break it down. You are right. We do not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, we probably should, Barry. I, can, just, I yeah. can tell you from experience that most of the folks responding here interpret it as security. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yes, you're right. We should specifically break it down so that that doesn't happen. Good. Yeah, we we'll definitely will take it back to the team who actually do that. Um, I'm bringing all of time. I actually want to talk about this is. I think this is the thing, another thing about BCP. It's actually good about 95% of the respondent dedicate security resources. However, we are disappointed about the second part of here is that the proportion of respondent implementing anti-spoofing has fallen. This is not good, given that we all heard about all this reflection amplification attack, one of the very effective ways to stop it is to do anti-spoofing, imprint that in your network. And look like this is, has not been done in a lot of the service provider side. Mm -hmm. And finally, as I mentioned, <laughs> this year we actually put a section about we talk to mobile operator. We ask them a bunch of questions about, okay, their um, security practice. So 68% of the respondent has actually more than a million subscribers. Wow. And then LTE deployment become persuasive. 80% of them do not support IPv6. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. But um, the other things about that is 70% of the respondent in that there is an outage and which is customer visible. The customer actually know that. This is outage. And then they get three quarter of the response cannot detect a compromised subscriber on the network. I think this is hard to do, so we don't blame them. Assess list and NAT, PAT are the most common defensive measure. But I think we also have started to talk to um, this mobile operator, and then they probably have to look at other security measures as well. DDoS in the Mobile operator. Now, 36% of them have told yes, they have seen DDoS attack. Now, and then the DDoS impact on the IP infrastructure, 57% say they do not know, but probably about 30 something, one third of them, yes, they have an impact on the, on the infrastructure of DDoS. So I believe the, the scale of the attack is still not very significant as we come in, we have probably haven't seen 400 gig of attack happen there. But again, there will be something of a more concern in the future as we see more people using the mobile device instead of PC and notebook and things like that. So, and only 7% see attack on the GI infrastructure down from 24%. Okay, good. So, as a conclusion, here is we have been doing that for 10 years, and we see network and the way they've been used have been changed. And then we also start to diversify in our response. In the first, I think, four to five years, we're very concentrated on service provider. So most of our respondents are service provider. We start to actually include more enterprise customer, or sorry, or, ent or people for enterprise side as a respondent. We actually want to reach out and actually learn more from that because that helped us. And especially, I'm not too sure how many of you here actually participate or actually get a questionnaire from us. If you do not and you really like to do that, reach out to us. We have a booth out there. I would like to actually okay, get you into our list so that we send you the questionnaire next time and survey. And I think we, we do believe that this is a fair useful too. It helps us to understand what has happened, what's the trend, so that we get prepared. Okay, they all sometimes they turn up with some unexpected results. For example, like DNS security, I was just talking to someone here. Maybe we should start to do something more, educating um, the people in the industry about what they really need to do. They should actually seriously consider protecting the DNS infrastructure. Okay, anti spoofing and all this BCP thing we should do. Because it seems to us from the survey, the less people um, being serious about that one. 
So I think I'm almost get on time. Very good. Thanks a lot for your time. Okay, thank you. Awesome, thank you. Are there any more questions just before we go on with our last speaker? No? Okay. I'd like to in introduce our last speaker. Uh, yeah. e e um, Hiromi-san. Who, who will talk to us a, a little bit about what they're doing to secure IPv6 gears. Um, my name is Ruri Hiromi from uh, Intech Corporation. Um, today I give a short talk about uh, introducing JPSAT-CC's activity for securing IPv6 gears as a proxy of JPSAT. And uh, uh, many of you may be know the uh, JPSAT. Uh, the JPSAT uh, is a national uh, computer emergency response team coordination body, and uh, it was founded in 1996. Uh, details about JPSAT is uh, with this URL. Uh, and the JPSAT uh, CC as a coordination Center uh, provides uh, technical support uh, in response to computer security incidents uh, through coordinating uh, with other local and overseas research. But today, uh, I will uh, show you other activity uh, about from ordinary incident handling. Uh, JP Sat CC started to research the vulnerabilities of IPv6 protocol in nine, uh, 2008. <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> oh, <coughs> I'm sorry. That's one. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> so, ah, uh, to continue. Ah, uh, JP thought, ah, uh, that's next. So, uh, JPSAT start uh, the study about IP6 vulnerability in uh, 2008 and uh, uh, make uh, some report and updated it uh, on, in uh, 2012. Uh, we picked, uh, picked up over 70 vulnerability issues uh, from internet draft and the RFCs. Uh, uh, most of all RFCs or internet draft has a security section uh, to describe about its uh, security threats or sometimes the solution for that. And uh, we divided them into the categories such as extension header issues or multicast issues or uh, representation and operational issues and so on. And uh, we also confirmed some uh, problem pro problematic cases uh, with actual router uh, in a small network. Uh, at that time, the reports are provided only to the vendors. Uh, after that, uh, So uh, the activity is now on uh, to the information, uh, providing information. And uh, uh, our target network is very simple uh, with, a LAN, with a one LAN and uh, one connection to the internet. And uh, uh, the estimated router on the center is a very small or mid-sized uh, at the, in front of the internet. So uh, with the test package, sorry, we, <coughs> I missed something. So uh, JPSAT provides some test tools uh, to 
uh, test uh, in that kind of network. And uh, with the package, uh, vendors can check the 15 test cases uh, for the attacks coming from outside in, in, the, in their network. I, I have a uh, hay fever, sorry. <laughs> so, and uh, uh, so JP start, start to provide a uh, test tool uh, to, the band, uh, to the vendors upon request. Uh, all, of, all are free, and the uh, tools has uh, also document about uh, how to proceed the test and uh, uh, detailed description about 15 vulnerabilities. And uh, the tool, about the tool, uh, we're using open source software, and uh, of course the, uh, the source, uh, open source softwares are all evaluated and uh, confirm execution of 15 test cases. So uh, we made some customize to the software uh, here is the uh, original software. And uh, uh, these, uh, I listed 15 test cases. Uh, this very detailed. Uh, please uh, see the slides later. So uh, for the dose protection, uh, we set the dose resistance metric. Uh, it consider of three aspects of a router. Uh, one is do not reboot. Uh, the second is do not hang up. The last one is return to the original condition after dose was stopped. And then the for example, uh, uh, I picked uh, from uh, one, one case from 15 of them, uh, type zero routing header is, uh, the test case one is described as disabling the type zero routing header processing. Uh, why we choose this? Uh, because uh, type zero routing header is now uh, deprecated in RFC 1595 but uh, originally defined in RFC 2460 uh, in the early uh, 1998. Uh, in the, uh, for the period of description, uh, we have uh, almost 10 years, and uh, in the 10 years, we have uh, two implementation lines. Uh, one is the before nine, uh, 1595, uh, and uh, one more is the after RFC 90, uh, 1595. So uh, it is very important to know uh, for the users to use, but the, uh, the implementation, uh, but the, uh, it is very difficult to, to confirm uh, from the vendor's catalogs or even more difficult to verify with implementations. So that uh, we provide the information about uh, uh, how is the threat and how to test the case uh, to the vendors and uh, with the vendors uh, checking <coughs> these problems. And uh, also we get some information from vendors. Uh, we supply production list uh, to the users. So now we are six vendors on the list and uh, uh, brocade, NEC, Furukawa, Hitachi Metals, Century Systems, and Yamaha. The list is up to date 
when we have uh, get vendor information. And uh, so uh, the current state uh, stat status is Cisco and the allied terraces and IO data show interest to the test program. And the uh, Codenomicon, uh, Codenomicon is a security vendor uh, known as their fuzzing tool uh, named Defensex. And uh, they implemented our 15 test cases to their fuzzing tools. And uh, if do not prefer open source software, uh, you can choose this product instead. And uh, here is the Codenomicon's fuzzing tool snapshot. <coughs> and uh, some vendors participated in the program, and uh, JPSAT published a secure product list. So, so uh, JPSAT do not does not intend to do. Uh, certification business. Uh, the, our aim is provide useful information for users, especially to share vendors' effort. We want vendors to share our research and uh, use them for rele uh, releasing so secure products. For future activity, uh, we <coughs> want to brush up test tools and reconsider test cases. Also welcomes more participation. And uh, to expand this activity, uh, we wrote an internet draft and uh, gave a talk at IETF meeting, uh, formerly IETF meeting. And uh, I ask your participation uh, with uh, what do you think about the draft? or uh, any kind of comments or uh, welcomes. And uh, if you have any interest with this program, uh, please contact us. Uh, for the participation, uh, please visit our webpage. That's all. Thank you. Uh, I have missed uh, some slides. <laughs> I'm sorry. Awesome. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for any of our speakers today? No? Well, then, thank you very much for coming along. I'll give you back some of your evening, and um, yes, I'll see you at the next session. Thank you very much.